Hello. Today we have an incredible panel and we will be talking about the history of activism in Cuba with people who have been involved for a long time, some of them. Others have joined more recently. An interesting point is that the panel represents a great variety of forms of activism. We have Larissa, who is a lawyer and who has uh, helped many of us to deal with the law. Leo Otaño, who is uh, an activist, a person of faith and very well known for his work with the community. And Salome Bacallao, who is an activist and researcher whose work focuses on working with the families of uh, political prisoners. The panel will focus on the history of activism in Cuba. Something that is odd about Cuba is that activism has been co-opted by the state there, by the regime, I mean. When the revolution emerged, they started to develop activities such as uh, the care of certain social sectors. Something that normally would have been handled by civil society was handled by institutions or pseudo-institutions created by the state to enter, take over uh, areas, activities that should be handled by society 
itself. So I think that maybe many of us have become activists without yet really knowing what it was about or the history. I have even met people who maybe have lived in Cuba and when they leave Cuba, they begin to realize that some of these activities should not be controlled by the state. So I would like to ask, uh, ask uh, Salome and Larissa, first of all, to tell us about the history of activism in Cuba. There is an important history and the Cuban people have seized the reins of many social issues even before the revolution. It's not such a recent thing. And we also know that there are many different types of activism. So my question to Salo is, could you tell us about the history of activism, which uh, you have an, uh, done a lot of research on? And Laritza, could you tell us how different concepts have been applied to the same thing in Cuba, or are they different things? Activism, dissidents, these things are often confused. So these are my first two questions. Thank you for inviting me. I hope that you can hear me well. First of all, I am a feminist activist and a Cuban citizen who, be, who became an activist in exile. Uh, so I have focused my research on these two aspects. Clearly, before the revolution triumphed, and in fact, it was not a triumph because revolution was meant to rescue institutions which had been co-opted by the dictatorship and to reestablish the constitution of 1940. And this purpose was never, never fulfilled. But before 1959, there were social movements in Cuba, feminist groups, etc. And they, uh, for the most part, uh, hinged around social clubs or societies like Liceo de la Habana. These were groups that were involved in politics. Perhaps they were based on private institutions. Maybe it was a bit more of an assistentialist position, but they did play a role, for example, Liceo de la Habana, this association uh, had close ties with President Grau. And it is known that around the time of the 1940 constitution, they did a lot of work uh, for improving the rights of women etc. So there was a strong civil society. There were also unions, labor unions, and other associations of workers or professional associations. And they had achieved a lot and had brought change, social change. I think that the constitution of 1940 is a uh, is proof of uh, the, the reach of uh, social claims that were captured in that text. So as you say, after there was the purported triumph of the revolution, uh, this uh, disarticulated many of these uh, earlier efforts and many of those who were involved in them uh, very soon became critical of the way in which the Castro family uh, seized control of power and the groups began, be, began to come apart. Many of uh, its members went into exile 
eh, como es eh, la, then, la coordinación de la misma de la operación Pedro you Pablo, have a, por ejemplo, para other moments a, a todas estas a todos estos niños que sus días no confiaban en el, en el proceso y eh, lograr que fueran acogidos en los Estados Unidos. Uh, for example, uh, movements that were uh, created to help the people who didn't agree with the regime to move to the United States. Then, as the regime became involved in extreme human rights violations during the 1970s and 80s, People who went into exile continued to work by combining in a very unique ways human rights activism and journalism. Humberto Madras is a representative of this kind of activity. He later became the vice president of Radio Martí. He was a journalist who investigated human rights violations and then um, was the a representative uh, for Cuba to the Human Rights Commission, the United Nations Human Rights Commission in New York. He brought political uh, prisoners who had been released to give testimony there. This is an example of this kind of articulation between human rights activists, journalists, former political prisoners, some of whom, some of whom were involved in a violent resistance. But we have uh, other activists who were concerned with the basically calling attention to human rights violation, and we have been doing this from exile. Uh, we've always uh, confronted a lot of resistance because the narrative created by the revolution has been. Um, very successful uh, abroad and so our efforts are often disregarded we have for example the pro human rights committee and the arrival of a human rights commission uh, United Nations Commission in Cuba and many people who were organizing to denounce human rights violations went into exile as well, as well in later waves. And people in exile coordinated to provide assistance to political prisoners. To conclude, I will talk about a landmark in 1995. For many, the timeline of Cuban activism begins in 1995, or what is known as the Black Spring. But there is a moment before the Black Spring, actually in 1995, when Concilio Cubano was founded. And at the time, a hundred civil society organizations came together to create a common program to propose a transition to democracy in Cuba. 
There were um, religious associations, uh, associations of lawyers, and people from many other fields. And this uh, reveals how strong civil society was. And then later on, around 2003, there was Proyecto Varela, which also had precedents of uh, others who had already, for example, collected signatures to demand for a referendum in 1991. But we see that the Cuban state has done a lot of work to erase this memory, and there are cycles of amnesia. And this means that connections between generations of activists are broken. We are prevented from learning some lessons, and so you have repeated uh, cycles of attempts to engage in conversation with authority, going into exile, and other efforts to try to make issues in Cuba visible in the human right, global human rights agenda. This is, I think, where we find ourselves now once again after July 11. The, there is a very troubling uh, disarticulation in civil society as a result of the amount of violence exerted during the past two years. And it's now an opportunity for us, hopefully, to learn a lesson and be extremely critical so that we, may, we might reconnect again. As I hear the history that Salo describes, I wanted to ask you, Larisa, indeed, there is a story where over and over again we are disconnected and new generations have to learn everything anew from scratch. Uh, they are not able to learn from previous successes and failures. And part of this is that we have different ways of naming this kind of activity. Sometimes it is called opposition, other times it is called dissidence. Recently it is known as activism. Uh, and uh, I, as, as you can explain, bueno, these forms of activity have been demonized in Cuba. Uh, I would say, uh, to begin with, that the topic of activism has become a bit corrupted because people need to qualify themselves to set themselves apart because there is discrimination. So you have oppositors, activists, journalists, dissidents. Sometimes we don't even know where to place ourselves, how to label ourselves and our work. The story begins when the state tries to control civil society. Civil society has always being one of the main targets of the Cuban state to control it even legally. In the 1980s, for example, by decree, it forced associations to register. And this is, at this point, many uh, religious organizations disappeared from the legal records, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, which were not allowed to register because they opposed a government policy. Um, here you have a different form of activism, namely religious activism, which its history is not very well known by younger generations, but religious groups have been for a long time executed in Cuba through forms of violence, especially bullying in educational contexts. That's one side of it. Then there are organizations that have political aspirations, namely the political parties. And here, what happens is that whoever has a critical vision 
of uh, government policies is labeled as an oppositor or a dissident. We were all raised through the revolutionary process. You know, well, we know, all, all Cubans know what we are taught in the schools. There's the picture of Fidel, a photograph. You need to have a positive assessment of uh, figures who are some, it's somewhat contradictory. At some point, you say, I don't believe in this, and you are labeled as an opponent. But this is not necessarily because you have a political uh, vision or that you have an expectation to reach to power. So in Cuba, it is said that not all oppositors are oppositors. For, for example, there are many organizations that bear the name a party. Nonetheless, in party, you cannot do engage in politics as part of a party. So although there are organizations that regard themselves as party, they cannot uh, oppose the government because they are repressed. So, um, this is a part of these are some of the conditions that determine active new forms of activism in civil society so you have some forms of activism that do uh, intend to do have some some form of political work and there are others who dissent, who criticize, and there are activists. But in this whole outlook, there is some discrimination against the kind of activism that has been exercised. Well, to give you an example, uh, during the years 2014, 2015, and your work, Susurro de Tatlin, around 2013-2014, that day we were going to document the imprisonment of activists. So around those years, there were many people going out on the streets with uh, written signs who were prevented from gathering, and they are known as street activists. Their demands are simple and basic. Then you have independent journalists who whose work is, let's say, a bit more intellectual. And we begin to see discrimination between activists who are treated, regarded as criminals by the state and so this is where you are led to label yourself depending on how the state discredits you. Let's say you work for a project that is uh, purported to receive funds from abroad. You are called a CAA agent and there are others such forms of labeling. So if you have groups from civil society who are working for environmental rights, animal rights, LGBTQI plus activism, activism for religious rights, the rights of parents to determine the education of their children, for example, the pastors in Guantanamo, there is a Jewish family whose children have been bullied for their their religion. So there are different forms of activism. And this is what nowadays, it's not, of course, the kind of disconnection that Salome described is very important because it has led us to lose parts of our history. What I have learned, where I have gone wrong, what might be useful to you is not written down, it's not documented. So we have a loss of historical memory and this is one of the aims of the government to prevent us from learning from our experiences throughout this long process. And I think it would be a very beautiful endeavor to rescue these processes. These efforts to prevent uh, memory is so that they can win, win some time to remain and hold on to power. So they are making time. 
estábamos hablando de oposición, disidencia. We were talking about opposition, dissidents, activism. It is true that sometimes there are people who have a very particular demand. Their activism has to do with the ecological issues, gender issues, something that they want to see happen in society. Dissidents perhaps have a greater awareness about a wider range of uh, social needs and liberties. And then you have oppositors who is explicitly uh, targeting the a changing government. So we have these parameters and they are used uh, in a very misguided way um, and the labels are used uh, as though they were synonymous when in fact it's not so at all. This has caused a lot of fear. Uh, people are scared to define themselves as activists because they will be labeled as oppositors and what the, the consequences will be the there are many other forms of activism i would like hilda and leo to tell us about it hilda you work with guardabosques and other projects in the 1990s and leo you come from a different tradition and i would like to know how is it that we now call activism a kind of activity that used to be let's say basic uh, in the practice of your the catholic faith the first, my first remark is that the word activism often is not inviting to many people because I think that the the, ex, the Christi, Christian experience is sacramental our attitude our civic attitude well as you know totalitarianism always say that christians cannot uh, be involved with politics but in catholicism uh, the church defined its social doctrine we have a commitment that was engaged that we assumed as catholics from the time of uh, baptism we have a vocation to be a prophet priest and king this is something very simple there is an abc you cannot be silent you have a commitment against injustice and you have to engage in it through faith so all christians experience this and it has grown stronger in cuba i think that uh, above all within the catholic church to which i belong we are seeing something happening now that is not new i am proud of my church because for over 60 years with up ups and downs and after going through a lot of repression we were prevented from having access to certain careers and we were treated as second class citizens but there have been very important moments one of them during the fight against Batista's dictatorship at the early stages of the revolutionary process before it reached its totalitarian stage, there was uh, Acción Católica Universitaria and another Catholic association of young Catholics who were doing social work. On July 26, one of the people who, alongside Enrique Pérez, went to look for Fidel Castro was Tony Canto, who was the president of Acción Católica in Santiago de Cuba. So these were people whose commitments when they witnessed the assassinations during the dictatorship, they responded according to their Catholic commitments. And I think we should acknowledge the work of a generation of Catholic bishops 
like Enrique Pérez Cerantes, who at first supported the revolution in its uh, uh, claim attempts towards social justice, but who also discovers totalitarianism and suffered then we have Pedro Meurice and Jaime Ortega, uh, people who have often been criticized. But when we see, for example, Love Awaits All, a text written by the Catholic bishops and especially by Jaime Ortega, I think that often the kind of support that the church has provided well, in its 2,000 years of history, the church has learned how to work silently. And it was something that was not necessarily visible. Uh, so people, for example, often fail to recall how much good uh, Cardinal Ortega did, for example. The Eastern tradition is much more frontal, and we see this, for example, in the discourse of the speech of Dionisio Garcia, whereas uh, the Western uh, tradition is a bit more diplomatic. Then we have the ENE, the National Ecclesiastic uh, Meeting, where uh, many lay Catholics became involved. Some people were extremely afraid. They have, they had been repressed to their flesh and bones, and they, they said, "This is eternal. This will never end." And they had a civic and theological position of uh, looking for solutions. But there are others like Orlando Payá who who had a stronger stance. I also respect, for example, what Dagoberto has been doing. For many years, he didn't mind being sent to a labor camp. He did it. And there is a, a vocation that we regard as in agreement with the social doctrine of, doctrine of the church. It's difficult for us sometimes to understand this because uh, it's part of what we experience as believers. So I think we are yet to capture in a, in a term exactly what this kind of activism is, if, if, because it's a mixture of activism and faith, because to be silent in the face of injustice for a Christian, it's no easy thing. And then we have what has happened after July 11, because this is uh, very interesting. Right now, we see how the Cuban church is divided. One branch of the church is in agreement with the Pope Francis's uh, reforms. And the second branch is closer to John Paul's um, propositions and a bit more conservative uh, socially. And this allows us to see how there are also many nuances in the church's ability to do social work. You asked about types of activism. I think we should think about it in two different ways. First, we understand activism in other countries and then how we understand it in Cuba whose realities are very peculiar. So I would start with the basics. 
activism is first of all an active engagement an activist isn't sitting at home thinking about concepts or relaying news or information although they might be doing that but it's a specific figure in civil society of somebody who is campaigning organizing communities so we have to understand what is specific about activism and also how it differs from political militants so activists are not necessarily oppositors because they don't need necessarily to support a political aim with that in mind we have to see that in Cuban reality, activism is sort of self-made. We didn't learn it from anywhere else. We had to learn it as we went along. First, because any form of activism is an anomaly for a totalitarian regime. Accor according to the regime, it shouldn't exist, and it puts a lot of work into preventing it from existing it's clear that the Cuban state is engaged in this kind of work. So if activism has arisen out of need, I think that the first step is not to take further steps uh, in gaining specific demands, but it is responsive. So it's uh, at first connected to the struggle in defense of human rights and independent journalism, because undoubtedly independent journalism created an important space. And then, you know, when you introduced me as an activist, I thought, okay, this is complicated, right? Because uh, for the past few years, I think Salome and I were talking about this, that there is now a kind of reflexive activism. It doesn't mean that activism is not off typically reflexive, but that we have been challenged to engage in a kind of a reflective exercise because uh, there is this effect of erasure where the history of activism is deleted and each generation has to reinvent its strategies, consensus building mechanisms, etc. I think it's uh, it's hard to make a timeline. It would be to schematize a reality that goes far beyond that. But I think that we have had at least four waves of expansion and there is then a response from the state that leads to massive exodus which is uh, both an exile some people leave the territory but also some stay but they have to be silent if they are to survive this creates disconnection and it has happened at least four times i think it's happening now and i think previously it happened around 2008 when the cuba's independent cultural uh, movement was uh, uprooted radically as this has led us to a form of activism that is a bit more reflexive it might be academic kind of uh, reflection. It may be reflection that is happening outside of academia, but that it is engaged in rethinking itself. I see, for example, INSTAR as part of this uh, new kind of work. And in part, they have uh, devoted themselves to re restoring the memory of past activisms so that we might uh, make sense of what we are doing now in connection to previous experiences. There is also uh, 
Ipermedia, they have also been engaged in compiling and collecting testimonies. And I think that this has led us to a critical moment which uh, crystallized in the San Isidro movement. And this led us to try to think how to proceed forward. And so now you have a different kind of activism, which is an activism of memory. It might not look like activism because maybe you're not out on the streets, but you are compiling testimonies, organizing them systematically. Uh, and then there is also artivism. This is not a Cuban invention, but I think that it's it has been very strong in Cuba. And it has to do with the capacity of art to impact society, to mediate, to translate realities that are fragmented in totalitarianism because the real important point of totalitarianism is to create fragmentation. It wants academics to be here, oppositors to be there, it wants others to be fully in exile. So, of course, activism has the duty to connect what is fragmented, and I think that artivism and art that introduces certain issues into public discussion, I think that artivism in this sense has played a crucial role recently. I think that it's not so important to classify different forms of activism in the world. And then, okay, there are 10 forms and we have two for six. No, I think that we should understand that activism in Cuba is malleable and porous. And this is not a failure, but maybe rather a potency because this ability to take on different roles and combining roles and not be limited to a particular stance, but to find your way in the in the cracks left by the fragmentation, we have a possibility. It's hard, but there is some possibility of uh, forging a path ahead. Yes, you in Cuba, you meet the same activists engaged in 18 different uh, movements, LGBTQ, feminist, environmental. Did you want to say something, Salo? I think that it is also important to say that I think that there is uh, an activism that is not that is now developed around a particular demand, for example, gender inequality. Since the revolution disintegrated previously existing civil society organizations, and this has led to a lack of memory, but these new activisms that are working for particular causes, they usually at first begin by trying to engage in dialogue with institutions and evolve. Of course, they are not homogeneous. homogeneous. But there are some who are more willing to engage in dialogue than you have others who are more extreme, more radical. We see this happening, for example, uh, with regard to the referendum, the current referendum on the family code. I think also activism for cultural rights 
y, uh, y ahí también entonces se ve este componente. Also has this need to rescue memory, and this means that there is a, a strong academic component to this work because we're talking about a memory that is not recorded on paper. So there is a need to talk to people, to read what has been published outside of Cuba, to which people have had no access because uh, a lot. There are many things have been published abroad, but you have no access uh, to it unless you are able to connect with a particular library that has a collection. And I do think that we need to devote a lot of effort to that. And perhaps for this reason, it's diff difficult to move forward because you have to devote so much time to do work that is pending, that is maybe hard to to work forward and achieve specific concrete things, not just that. Uh, also, activists in Cuba spend most of their time trying to be acknowledged, to have your existence acknowledged. Okay, maybe we can talk about the present now. I would like to ask you how you think it might be possible to resolve a dichotomy between activists in Cuba who defend first generation rights like freedom of expression, of political association, etc., and a new generation that is uh, focused predominantly or has, let's say, specialized in fourth generation rights, such as. Uh, identity rights, uh, environmental rights, etc. How do you think we could resolve this dichotomy? Because there is a, a complex tension that I think could fragment the work that has been done by activism during the past few years, because there is a bit of a confrontation, internal confrontation amongst ourselves. And I think that actually the Cuban regime can benefit benefit from that because we would be fighting amongst ourselves. Tania, I think that uh, it is always a matter of generosity. If, if same-sex uh, marriage is approved tomorrow by referendum, we will have achieved something. I think we need to know that the other person has value and has their path, and that their path, if we keep a distance that is a healthy distance, a democratic distance, if tomorrow people who are fighting for animal rights achieve something, they have gained something against totalitarianism. They have forced them to deal with an individual instance of repression. The sole thing that we have left is our bodies. And we need to articulate these struggles and say what needs to be said. Of course, we must always uphold what is basic. If tomorrow seamstresses uh, get together and demand uh, thread, they are visibilizing labor precariousness, they are visibilizing basic needs. This is why, for example, I think that Amelia Calzadilla, I think that this was a very interesting case because it proves that citizens are using the resources at hand to protest as they can. Sure, the civil society movements are folding back and repression has become 
impossible, but some mothers silently went to the hill. I have a friend who went by in their bicycle, and when they saw him, they requested for his ID card because he had been out on July 11. But people are protesting with their pots against the electricity cuts. But when you analyze the process, as a whole, well, why do we have power cuts? The conga at Mayabe, which I think was amazing, they were saying we want freedom. So people are demanding more and more. And I think that this is very interesting to see. Okay, I will try to contextualize again we have to be aware of the context in cuba the people are going to vote to approve or reject a family code which is uh, let's say progressive in the context of the Latin American context, and which seems to have nothing to do with the regime that uh, has uh, proposed it. So it's a country that is totally analog, and they are proposing a family code that seems to be fit for a European country. So now we're talking about uh, demands that a particular community has been fighting for for a long time. There, there was an unauthorized march, which is uh, uh, something that rarely happens in Cuba for uh, queer rights. And it's odd that the regime is now using this referendum to strengthen itself by pretending to uphold these uh, rights. So there is supposed to be a mechanism proper to direct democracy being used by a totalitarian regime. And yet at the same time, the same regime, uh, it has not drafted a penal code that will make any forms of uh, dissent or discrepancy, even among people who are outside of the country, uh, they have uh, approved this new penal code in secrecy. They approved this penal code in parliament, but this is the only parliament in the world where everyone always votes yes to a government project. So I think that whatever generation rights we are talking about, we always have to go forward. It's, we can say that because this regime is totalitarian, we are not going to fight for equal marriage until the government is over. This is very difficult to keep that because if you are fighting for particular rights, you might be interpreted as engaging with the government. And this has caused a lot of damage because uh, there is a regrettable infighting. I think that rights, gains in rights should always uh, be defended because, you know, we say that freedom calls for further freedom, but we cannot, for, we cannot neglect, ignore the fact that these struggles are being instrumentalized. And so maybe, I mean, you cannot oppose, for example, in this case, the referendum. You, could, you cannot advocate for a negative vote. That's not an option for me. But some people, for example, are arguing strategically in favor of abstaining from voting in the referendum. And this is an option that we should consider legitimate. I am not telling people to abstain. But we should regard this as a legitimate position if those who 
who are calling all people to abstain to acknowledge publicly that they regard these rights as fundamental. At this point, we think that the referendum will be approved, but I think that when we are talking about rights that we do think should be upholded, we must create awareness as to the way in which the regime is instrumentalizing the conferral of these rights. So you can agree, we should agree with the text of the code, but a problem with the regime and its procedures. I think that this is what we should discuss. Totalitarianism is like the empire state. It has many floors, the foundations go deep, but it's made out of many constructions that we have to put apart. And it Cuba, they don't really work anymore. But, you know, many people in Latin America will say, how can you say that Cuba is a totalitarian state if you have such a progressive family code? And we have to explain to them that totalitarianism can afford to do this. They can grant a particular right and keep in order to keep the entire structure running. And they might even come out stronger. There are examples. The other day I was reading about Rwanda. They also have a, a, an authoritarian regime and they have also instrumentalized uh, gender equality. So this is something that other authoritarian and totalitarian regimes have done. So we have to explain to these people in Latin America, of course, they can do this because there, there is there is a community that is struggling. They are putting a lot of work into it and they have forced them to do this. So we have to change the narrative and undermine the discourses that they construct on the basis of these changes. We want this, this narrative to be framed in our terms and not, not in their terms. And of course, we should acknowledge our own victories. And I say we here in a very broad sense. I think that this we encompasses civil society, including the LGBTQI plus community. Yo voy a hacer un poquitico más de, de la abogada de, de diablo con, con la parte que me toca. Eh, lo primero es que esa, eh, los activismos de derechos civiles, políticos y por acá los otros de cuarta generación mencionaste. Yes, I think that these uh, generations that you discussed and these different forms of activism, this is all a myth. I think that the myth has been created to polarize us. I think that we have to realize that we have a civil society that has grown in a closed context. If you have not experienced freedom, then, well, what is it? We are going to get into an argument if we have not learned to engage in democratic conversation, right? So we are behaving like sometimes like those who we criticize because we know no better. So in this current discussion about whether to vote or to abstain, our first concern should be that the freedom to vote is a right of citizens. You cannot tell people to only vote for what you want. If you want me to vote, yes, convince me. This is what activism does. Why should I vote yes? Why should you vote yes? So tell me why it is necessary for me to vote yes or no, or why should I abstain? This is our work because we keep talking amongst ourselves, but there is a population, citizens who are looking towards us, they want to learn, they have access to the internet, and they want guidance. So I think that we first should ask ourselves, what do we need as a civil society? We need to respect ourselves. 
we need to learn how not to discriminate. And this concept is transversal, whatever we're talking about. So you start to have discrimination among different groups about whether you are or not, what you do or you fail to do. But if you read the Declaration of Human Rights Defenders, the United Nations Declaration, the first request is to never discriminate. So it is not up to us to acknowledge people's rights or not to acknowledge them. Well, if the family code is approved, can it really be enforced in Cuba? Well, it's not up to us. Not even if we vote, this is a simulation. We know how the electoral system in Cuba works. So we know that probably the code will be voted yes and it will be approved. That's how they conceived it. So what is left for us to think? Well, what does the code have that restricts our rights? And we have to try to change it. For example, the penal code has not been discussed or criticized as much as the family code. And I don't know how to call this code. I would say it's criminal. That's right. You cannot understand, you cannot read this code that concludes that you can, that there is something that you can do. It seems that anything you do could earn you, at the very least, a fine, but also imprisonment. And civil society has not devoted the effort that it should have to examine this text and criticize it and work against its approval. We have not been able to do this, and we are debating a family code, which I do, I am saying, don't polarize, convince us that we need it, let's do this work, and then let's respect the citizens' vote, and if you don't want to vote, that is your right. So I think that we in civil society need to do more of this. We need to examine to what degree we are replicating the patterns of the regime that we are criticizing. This is why I said that I want to play the role of devil's advocate, because I want us to look in the mirror and examine, and examine ourselves. I think that totalitarianism gets into our blood. When you're a child, you are repeating slogan after slogan. And you can see it. I remember I worked as a volunteer in some villages in Santi Espiritu, and the children, sometimes you would ask them a question and they would wholeheartedly respond with the slogan. And we see this in Twitter. Something that I also find very interesting. The same thing that happened with the penal code is happening with the new media law. It's a similar context. And I also think... And I think that polarization, we have to be clear that we are engaged in an exercise of diversity of thought and not polarization. So I received a message a few days ago. And uh, it was the same that we have to get rid of old notions. What was the advantage of the family code for Democrats in Cuba? Well, that we could say we are one step ahead of you. We are making claims, we are debating, we are aware that you are manipulating the context, that you are 
you see uh, this right looking up your image, I was talking to a Latin American aunt the other day. Uh, she's, the, she's a leftist. She went through the dictatorship, and she told me, "Well, but you have a you have a state apparatus in Cuba," and I said, "Yes, and this uh, apparatus is used to train people's lives." So I think that we have to continue working on articulating and reflecting; otherwise, it will happen again. What will be the next law? What will be the next the next smoke screen? Because they can always use one. The the same thing happened with the constitution. Now, same-sex marriage. And so uh, I agree here with Hilda. I think that this is a part of the work that intellectuals have to do. Intellectuals have to connect with people. Sometimes we are writing dense texts and theoretically they work wonderfully, but uh, how can you connect with the citizens? This is why I think that podcasts and other strategies that rely on humor, I think that this is all extremely important. Because I think Cuba, we have to devote a lot of time, a lot of time to education. Because the system has uh, used education to stay in power, even more than repression. So as we continue to strengthen social fabrics and capacity for discussion, activism, as we gain more and more space and to do it with cunning, I think that this is very important. I wanted to know if Sala has something to add here. I think that we really have to try to understand others and their motivations respectfully. The fiction that there are first, second, third generation rights in Cuba, we have not. So right now there are many a diversity of uh, demands and requests coming from civil society. And as you go from the circumstances of your own life that have inflected your direction in activism, for example, maybe exile is uh, what is most important for you at some point in your life. And so you will, of course, fight for one particular right, the right to enter and leave your country. Or the fact, for example, that those of us who are not awarded the right to vote because we are not living in Cuba. But then I understand that there are also people in civil society who for example, might not agree with the right of same-sex couples in Cuba to marry or to adopt. They might contest the monopoly over education held by the Cuban state. Uh, to talk about the penal code again, I think that here we need to be consistent. We need to, it needs to be clear that many people in Cuba, in Cuban civil society, will situate themselves outside the law. So those, those who say that they are not going to vote on the referendum because they don't acknowledge the validity of Cuban law, they should also see themselves as uh, outside the penal code. So it takes 
a willingness to say say, I advocate for your right to marry and my right to participate or the right to say I don't want to participate. And these rights do not contradict each other. They have to coexist. And we have to understand that there are many demands in a society and each from their position will regard some as more important or let's say rather more urgent than others. I wanted to say that the discussion around the family code we, we think at this point that we have described it as favoring minorities, but actually it is a code that favors majorities, because if you add mothers and fathers uh, independently of other transversals, whether they are poor Afro-descendants, poor peasants, bearing in mind that in Cuba, poverty has been feminized so this is not a code for that favors minorities i am not campaigning for the yes if i could vote i would vote yes but i do think that um, maybe because uh, the lgbtqi plus movement has gained greater visibility re recently it is regarded as a code that favors that community, but actually the code uh, responds to demands that have been uh, fought for before. Already when I was in school, we were talking about a reform of the family code. I think since 1995, I remember these discussions. I also think that I would vote yes, not just because there is a same-sex marriage, but in my position as a single mother in Cuba, but also I think that it's very important that the code uh, finally bans uh, marriage among minors. Which, were, which is legal in Cuba. We have campaigned to have this uh, eliminated from Cuba's legal framework. And if you vote for the penal code, you need to bear in mind that there are many other implications to this code. We have, uh, we have focused on como activistas, como periodistas independientes, la falta además de acceso nuestro a los medios de comunicación. Of course, we have also had no access to the media and the regime has co-opted this discourse. And we don't believe the regime. They have said too many lies. They say that we have access to food. Why should we believe them now if they are saying that they are concerned with the rights of the LGBTQI plus community. As you know, I am not optimistic, but I don't, I don't, I don't also feel pessimistic right now. I think that the debate has been extremely hard, but I think that we can uh, create agreement because we have new voices like your own. You know, you are taking on the role of devil's advocate, and I think that this is really important. When you said that we should be, what you said about marriage among minors, when we were talking about 349, remember people said, well, don't talk about censorship, uh, talk about how this law allows us to control child pornography. Well, I think that it's uh, difficult because uh, we as activists need to understand the difference. I think that something happening between these two groups, people who want the absolute freedom in Cuba to create everything from scratch because they have no confidence on what we have now.
y la gente que tiene una posición más de ir construyendo de a poquito y a poco. Want to build gradually and gain ground gradually and there is a tension between these two groups. And in part this has to do with the fear that the, when, when some people gain something, they will no longer be on our side. For example, will the LGBTQI plus community continue to fight for freedom in Cuba or now that they have gained something? So this is, so we are scared sometimes maybe that there will be, and many activists are worried about things like these. Bueno que el código de familia no es que respete todos los derechos de la comunidad LGBT, ¿no? Well, and let's say Pasa this, the family code is not respectful of all of the LGBTIQ plus rights community. No, For example, uh, trans people still do not have the right to have their gender acknowledged without having to modify their bodies. So, and uh, gender violence is reduced to domestic violence in this code. So, I mean, bear in mind that this code is not the best. And there is still discrimination embedded into the code. Uh, women activists have been threatened and the code will allow this. There are issues having to do with care and nourishment and the state is washing its hands. Knowing that there are obligations that the state should be assuming. So I just want to say that this is not the best possible law on the matter. There is still much work to do. Well, the government is very good at saying, okay, we gave you what you wanted, so. But I wanted. Tania, hold on. Cuando uno hace el ejercicio de la docencia, siempre cuando when otros están hablando, teach, están construyendo... You know, when others are talking, you are building something in your head. La cabeza te da muchas vueltas. And your head yo creo que, gets que si spinning around. I think that this debate de about the family code, es que a una it has shown that Cuba's civil society is growing in complexity and is also y eso es much que a ellos en el fondo more diverse. And this is ultimately what scares them, because I might agree or disagree, but look out, to abstain is a democratic value. So, you know, my vote is clear and, you know, but if you have people who are saying that they are going to abstain, this means that there is democratic thought. People are reading Jose Saramago. I would like now to see the other side of the coin. What do you think will happen with activism through, because of the new penal code? What are your predictions? Activism has created many spaces. What will happen now, Salo? You have been working with uh, the families of people who were imprisoned in 11J. What are your thoughts on this? I wouldn't venture any forecasts. Currently, there are 125 political prisoners in connection to the protests of July 11. And we have documented thousands of others who have been imprisoned and convicted, some, some are under house arrest. The context is now completely oppressive. There was a moment in which
esa desobediencia, lo que está quizás buscando mecanismos de... I think that the civil disobedience más efectivamente. Is at this point looking for ways to evade punishment. So I wouldn't dare venture any forecasts. My hope is that people will be able to shake off the fear and confront these forms, these myriad forms of oppression, and that we will be able to engage in a democratic transition and not have to worry ourselves about this penal code. About the referendum, I think that. Uh, In, in both cases, we need to visibilize and discuss, but we that we need to disobey and abstain. Well, we already have Law 88, and there it says that in Article 11, that if you receive funds from the United States, so we have to bear in mind that the government has used the the effect of using a code to control society. We are activists, we are already out of that, and we will be harassed. Our options are to leave the country or to adapt and come and work for the state. So this leads us to radicalization, but the penal code and other regulations in the structure, including other laws having to do with communication and legal process, what, is, what are they all about? Well, the, the internet has has deprived the state of uh, control. So, of course, they, they have been forced to afford society the right to you of access to the internet. And Obama, Obama did something, but also civil society has done a lot for us to be able to have that right. So the penal code is being used as a threat, but this has not prevented many from speaking out. Then uh, the crime of sedition, which has been used to intimidate the people who went out to protest on July 11th, well, the state is saying you should not uh, protest because we are going to regard pro any form of protest as uh, sedition within the legal framework. This all tells you that the state is losing control because they are trying to frame legally uh, something that they cannot really keep in check. Civil society will continue to organize and protest. We will be more or less organized and some, some will give up, but we need to focus on the work of the civil society. Cuba will change when we are able to respond to the citizens who are raising their demands. It doesn't matter if we're talking about environmental rights or animal rights. No activism is more important than any other because uh, this entails the right of every citizen to defend what they stand behind. And so regardless of whether we may we will have a penal code and other reforms intended to restrict uh, fundamental rights and exert social control, but it is clear that they cannot do this anymore. You have Facebook, WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups, and you have Uh, people in Santiago getting together with people from Finar, Finar del Rio and Havana. This couldn't happen before, and we have taken a step forward in this direction. So we sh of course, we shouldn't be afraid of the penal code because it's, uh, I don't know how long we have been under threat. So the late uh, law 88, the previous penal code, it has always been created to threaten us. The law is a tool for social control. Uh, these laws are not giving us any rights. It is a tool to lead you to refrain from exerting your rights.
So the regime uses uh, actions like the imprisonment of Luis Manuel and Michael Osorgo, the imprisonment of thousands of people. Don't you think that this intimidates us? Well, when we are talking about this, uh, using these kinds of examples, you imprison me and my neighbor will now no longer do something. Well, but your, your neighbor will say, okay, she was just a screaming freedom. And she's in prison now. But you know, it works to some extent, but you cannot reach the whole population that way because they don't have enough prisons. It's a double-edged sword for them because it damages the social fabric. In the case of La Winera, every family of the young men who were imprisoned, men and women, they have relatives, right? And uh, when you work around the neighborhood now, you rarely hear music anymore. It's a detail. There is silence. You have to be there to see how strong it is. I find it overwhelming. At the end of the year, when there are usually celebrations, everyone is quiet, and that will come out in some other way because the society finds a way to manifest its discontent. I mean, in our country, people use uh, camouflage, and it's part of our national culture. So, have the penal code, but people will come up with a way to say, because we are a resilient nation, so we find ways. We went, we, we went through brutal colonialism, two dictatorships, to rig the Republican times. Then we had a strong republic for a few years, and then 63 years of the so people know how to work the way around it. And new forms of civic utterance will emerge. And as a social scientist, I also abstain from any forecasts, but society will find a way. There is a flower called Maravilla. Do you remember? It used to bloom in May, but you would cut one and many more would come out. And this is what happens. During my last interrogation, my interrogation I talked to some of my students and they tell me that the kids in school uh, it's clear that reality young people do not see any possibility to develop concrete life projects I also abstain from forecasts because you do it and then you'll get it wrong. It's a complex situation, but uh, what I think is important is that we have to be clear that the conflict is becoming more intense. The state is now more openly controlling and oppressive. It directly represses it in prisons and gives you a 25 year sentence. And then you have a totalitarian control, which is uh, works to the details, it works, it undermines confidence among individuals, you are afraid of saying something because uh, your co-worker or your neighbor might be watching over you. Both forms of repression have grown stronger, and this shuts down the possibility 
of a, a way out for Cuba's horrible situation that is not violent. And this worries me greatly because we have tried in many different ways to find a peaceful solution and they have been dismantled one by one. And I think that 27N was our last attempt. And the next time dialogue had failed to such an extent as a mechanism that civil society did not want, didn't want to hear about dialogue anymore. Let's not talk about dialogue anymore, they were saying. So we now have to get them to call for dialogue and, and we will think what to do. So it has changed a lot in the last couple of years. State violence and repression have intensified. This is preventing any peaceful exit to the conflict. At the same time, we see that civil society is more openly willing to challenge and confront with greater resources. We had these dichotomies in Cuba, right? You had the dichotomy between inside and outside, the uneducated and the intellectuals. When people describe me as an academic, I feel a panic because it's not about that at all. With San Isidro, many of these dichotomies tumbled down. These are gaps that are completely have vanished now. It scares me nonetheless that you know the recent murder of a young black person by the police did not create the kind of reaction that you would expect. And this tells you that the, we still have some gaps that we need to to do away with. But even so, you see that a society that is more connected, the inside and the outside are connected, different parts of the country are connected, the diaspora is diverse, there is greater capacity to communicate with international organizations. We have 11J, and once you have tasted freedom, when you leave the prison cell, and we have a situation where we have no other option. So if you combine the desire for freedom, which is proactive and positive, with the living through a situation that can no longer be lived, no access, I don't mean to dignity and life, but to food, electricity, the possibility of doing something with your friends, Given so, such limitations, not even totalitarianism can keep that system going. So I think that um, it's not a forecast, it's something that I think that, sure, we need to acknowledge how difficult the conditions are. The power to change things is there, and it is not diminished in spite of everything in spite of exile, exodus, imprisonment, and this uh, intimidation by example. So I always say, in spite of you, tomorrow will be a different day. The sun will come out, the rooster will sing, and there will be light regardless of what you want. You may be able to get away with it for a, a few more years, but there is always a tomorrow. So it's not a forecast, it's a wager, it's a bet, and it's what we're working for. Hopefully, it won't take that long. In spite of polarization in many spaces, I think that totalitarianism is afraid of this. I don't know how many of us are aware of this. We have been talking about national reconciliation, and I stand behind that. But if but there is a process of national reconciliation among millennials, they are doing it on social networks, in parties. O sea, porque, eh, o sea, me fui, estoy luchando la fuera, pero me acuerdo de los míos. Uh, people who left are, stay close to those who stayed. And in 27 November or July 11, when I 
en no sé cuántos posts de mis compañeros, de mis amigos, de gente cercana. When I went into Facebook, I saw so many publications from people who never dared to speak up before, but now they are connected. These uh, gaps that were created and cracks created by totalitarianism in the generation of our parents, the separation between those who left and those who stayed, that doesn't exist anymore. People are helping each other out. Because those of us who have stayed, we have to help out, for example, the parents of those who have left, older people who didn't want to leave, you know. So, you know, the state is, you know, they're stupid. They cannot understand what is happening now because they only know about repression and control. When, when you lose everything, then all you have left is violence and these things that are happening elude them. And I think that we um, intellectuals, activists, we need to be more watchful. We need to to reflect and see and find ways to strengthen. We have these WhatsApp groups, right? We have a, a group of friends. There's a group called Puba, Puba Fuma. And the day before November 15, they were all... Pero son, o sea, que la gente eh, celebre tu cumpleaños a pesar de que tú estés mal visto, que te hayan votado. But for example, lado, if people are coming out for your birthday party in, in spite of the fact cosas, that the state has ostracized you, these things are happening. We have to be creative, we have to use camouflage, and these are our weapons. Uh, because I don't want, I do not want one more political prisoner. I will be honest. When I work with the families of political prisoners, I see too much pain. So we need to be more creative. We have already been quite creative, but we now need to reinvent ourselves to confront the new penal code. And we have to do this together. You were talking about WhatsApp on 27N. It was wonderful to see how the people outside and inside were speaking the same language. People who were outside were not telling people inside what to do, and people inside were not being reproachful of those who were outside. There was a shared experience. People were saying, look, I'm here in Mexico, and I have seen that they do this. I have had these experiences. What about if we do this? And I wanted to... Maybe move on to discuss this because many activists have lived outside of Cuba. They have been forced to leave the country. I would like us to talk a bit about international activism. What is happening? What is the relationship between activism in Cuba and activism in Latin America and Europe? What do you think is happening? Are there connections? Sometimes we feel that people in other countries don't support us. Activists from other countries don't support us in our struggles. Well, there is, you know, the ghost of what is called Cuban exceptionality, which abides. It is used to say that what happens in Cuba is completely different from what happens anywhere else, and this is not true. But we do have to acknowledge that there are different conditions. It's a form of government that has created a very different social condition from that of other Latin American countries, for example. In terms of society and activism, there are many shared points. Activism on issues of gender and race, I think, uh, have many connections to 
similar movements in Latin America, but there are others where we cannot connect. We don't have a shared experience. For example, in the field of environmental activism, for example, we don't have a discussion around the concept of territory in Cuba. So there is environmental activism and the government has attempted to co-opt it. But in Cuba, we don't have communities who are struggling for autonomy from the state, like indigenous communities in Mexico or Afro-descendant communities in Brazil. So we don't have these communities who are demanding autonomy from the state and who connect environmental struggles to the defense of their territories. We don't have a similar experience. And this creates some difficulties when we are trying to communicate our experiences and think and reflect on them. In a broader sense, I think we have two problems. For the most part, in Latin America, and it is up to us who are outside of Cuba to continue working against these constructed narratives that make people in Latin America think that Cuba is a leading light of the Latin American left. It's kind of like a chronic defeat. It's really hard to dismantle this image of Cuba in Latin America. This is uh, this country only exists in storytelling but it's still extremely powerful and this isolates us. For example, thinking about feminism, let's not forget that two years ago, two Abya Yala feminists in Latin America uh, issued a statement in support of the Cuban state. So you have Latin American feminists who support a Stalinist state. So, of course, it's hard to have a conversation with such feminists because the horizon of possibilities is very narrow. Or if we think about Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter also issued a statement in support of the Cuban state. And it makes it very difficult for the anti-racist movement in Cuba to forge an alliance with the anti-racist uh, movement in the United States, because if Black Lives Matter can, can, cannot acknowledge the similarity of the struggles and supports the Cuban government, so this, this creates a problem because uh, many social movements uh, in other countries uh, stand in support of the Cuban government. And on the other hand, you have we have also a kind of self-induced exceptionality, although, of course, it is an effect of this previous problem. I think that, you know, this happens often. Let's say you are a feminist in Mexico and she's going to talk with a feminist in Colombia. They can take some things for granted. There are some things that you don't have to explain. You're talking about the patriarchy and you don't have to explain that. But if you're a Cuban feminist and you're going to talk to a Colombian feminist, you have first to explain this particular kind of patriarchy. You have these uh, revolutionary generals dressed in green, a militarized uh, patriarchy, and then it's uh, you have the problem. You cannot even convince people in Latin America, get them to understand totalitarianism in the European style, which we have, because they may have experienced only authoritarianism. So we have a lot of bridges to build, to cover gaps and sometimes a business. So this goes in two ways. First, we have to dismantle the narratives and meta-narratives of the quote-unquote revolution. We have to dismantle their narratives to get people to understand that we have many shared experiences with other activists in the country 
in the continent because you know, we are part of Latin America. This is our context. We are not in Mars. And then we have to do a lot of work to translate the U.S. concrete situation in terms that can be understood in other countries. And here we have another drama because some firms work in Miami, but they don't work in Mexico. Then you go to Argentina, and then you need to find another way of putting it. But we have to be flexible to work out this uh, variety of translations. And then a third thing, experience. We also have to learn from other experiences. I always think that although in Cuba we don't have, because of our particular circumstances, we don't have an indigenous community defending their territory against uh, a mining company, although we don't have similar experiences, we need to make an effort to, to hear what the people in such situations have learned, because at some point there are similarities. So how do you do a kind of activism that can work against the state, although it acknowledges the state, community-based activism? These are ways of uh, thinking that come from different experiences, but which share a lot with ours. So we also have a lot to learn. There is also something very particular when it comes to Cuba, namely that many of Latin America's social movements, the movements in defense of certain freedoms that we also want in Cuba, many of those movements in Latin America are sponsored and funded by Cuba's regime. So these people who are receiving support, people like Angela Davis, for example, these people have received support from Cuba's regime. They have received funding and spiritual support. So, you know, they don't want to talk to, to us because they cannot understand what connects us, but they they are worried about betraying. Sometimes we have different settings, but the same problems. In 2012, I understood, for example, the struggles of the communities for schools, issues to, about transportation, so there, you can, because of independent journalism, you become aware of certain issues. We are becoming more and more aware of uh, similar realities in Cuba. Bueno, hablando de mi experiencia, compartiendo con eso en esos escenarios en Latinoamérica. Well, in my experiences when I have been in Latin America and talked to activists in Colombia, Mexico, for example, I find that the discussions around human rights are informed by uh, strong ideologies. This is, you know, your position is understood ideologically and not from the point of view of human rights. I'm not talking about politicization because uh, Politicization is everywhere, but the question is, are you left, are you right, center right, center left, and this is what informs the debate, and I think it's a problem throughout Latin America. It's not simply that they regard uh, Cuba as a paradise, although it, there is a single party rule and the same political group has been in power for 63 years. If you ask anyone in Latin America if they want that in their country, they will immediately say, no, I don't want that. Well, then why do they want it for Cuba? Why should we accept it? So there is a romanticism, old dreams, 
and the image sold by the Cuban government, and this all plays a role. But first, of, first and foremost, we we Cubans, we have to understand the Latin American context, and we have to work on the basis of that. We have to convince. I think that I said this at the start. Okay, let me explain you my context and why I work as I do. I have to, you know, let's not. It's not about getting into an argument. I want to convince you, and I think that this is the only way in which we will be able. We are going to open up and look for the spaces. Often they they don't allow us in without even hearing what we have to say there is prejudice and discrimination against us it's happened to me even in universities sometimes so we are not given a chance to speak well we have to fight to be heard we have to look for space we don't. Larissa, I respect people who remain within the institutions with a position of dissent. I think that is a victory. And it happens more and more. We will have to consider something that happens in Latin America. We have to we examine the effectiveness of this uh, sacralized image of Fidel más en, en conexión con la Unión Soviética que con nosotros países de Europa este vivió una sacralización eh, personalización eh, en Cuba el power was estado, personalized Fidel, and sacralized Fidel was power Entonces, yo creo que uh, we, eso, we saw this when he died so we have to tell many people on the left I experienced this in Argentina in 2017 Sí, son preguntas sencillas, eh, porque es como un todo impoluto. Because it's una visión que cuando tú vas a esas personas en el contexto que están insertos es todo lo contrario. If you examined the context in which these people operate, you find the op the opposite. So it's very important to have exchange and to Congreso de Claxo. A few months ago, there was the Claxon Congress, the person who expelled me from the PhD program was there, Claxo, talking about academic freedom. What did I do? Well, they have a Twitter account. There wasn't a profile. I, I said what I had to say to everyone on that Twitter account. I followed each of the people for the organization and I presented my, my complaint to them. I don't know if uh, Salome can uh, hear us and if she wants, uh, has something to say about the relationships between activism in Cuba and activism elsewhere. It's not clear what's going on with Salo. Well, at this point, I wanted to take some questions from the audience. We have a question by text. It's a bit long, but I think it's worth uh, discussing it. Uh, maybe it's a simple question. What are the challenges for activism that focuses on legal investigation? I mean, what challenges are there in Cuba for a society 
that is being overwhelmed by legal norms, judicial procedures, and institutional structures that aim to remain in power. How can an activist demand scrutiny from something that has been validated by being included in the legal framework. In other words, how can we fight against an issue that is closed and that cannot be altered uh, from a legal point of view? So how can legal frameworks be changed without being um, uh, open rebellion. I'm not talking about uh, civil disobedience. There are many forms of disobedience. I'm talking about rebellion because I think that this is one of the challenges that we confront in Cuba. We cannot go too far in the exercise of uh, demanding your rights if these rights are not even legally framed. Well, this is a really complicated question. Yeah, from my experience, I would say that, and I think it's the experience of many others, the campaign around 349, which is a regulation that is now in force, it led us to analyze the rights that it restricted and how it impacted social movements, artists, not only artists, religious groups, the Yoruba religion, their chants could be interpreted as a falling under that code. So although, although the decree is valid, it has not been enforced. And the United Nations uh, requested the government to account for itself. So, so the law is not being currently enforced. And this may be a result of the kind of uh, inquiry that we engaged in. We studied the text, we denounced. And we can use the human rights framework to do that uh, as a first instance because the government is very bad at writing the text of laws. To read one of these uh, bills is worse than hell because uh, you need to figure out what they're trying to say. Even the family code, when you examine some of the articles, if you consider the reach of the regulation, you will get lost. For example, when it comes to care and the responsibility of those relatives to provide food for children, it's really hard to understand. The article on adoption is very badly written and it allows for interpretations that are, could be really nasty, let's say. We have been debating this in our legal team. So the way that the law is written, it prevents uh, citizens from understanding and lawyers from applying the regulation. And so in the case of a norm that restricts uh, human rights, they do this with even more clear intent. But the LGBTIQ plus community, for example, at some point issued critiques to the bill and they were taken into consideration. And there are previous examples. We at Kubale, we did something similar in 2016. We presented three proposals for consideration for the constitutional reform. And there was a police raid on our offices, but they accepted one of our proposals. In 2016, Raúl Castro said, you know, so we, we, we think that we played a part in which, for example, uh, 
electoral procedures were framed in the new constitution. So we don't need necessarily to isolate ourselves. We're telling the government this is a violation of human rights. This is not progressive. Maybe we lose that fight, but then we proceed other ways. Otherwise. So now, Law 370, the penal code, we need to keep insisting on this. Why haven't they published the approved version of the code? Where is the text? Where is the text? We want to see it. Why haven't they published it? What happened is the, are the presses not working? So I don't think that anything is impossible. I think that you have to give it a shot. And I think that if we thought we were impossible, we would not be engaged in activism. So they cannot be more powerful than all of us together. And perhaps we don't all think alike, but we all agree that the penal code cannot stand, so we work against it. So here we are working against a context in which the law is used as a tool to control society, and we have to struggle to find tools by which to dismantle it using sometimes their own tools. We have been often been criticized because we use uh, legal resources. But for example, habeas corpus allows us to find out about the deficiencies of the system, and we have been able to explain, for example, because in Cuba you have arbitrary detention, temporary disappearance. So we don't just need to analyze, we also have to put into practice a to work within a dysfunctional a system with inadequate resources because I need to be able to have concrete examples that I can use to explain someone because we can talk about for example european union organizations i can exp they want the government won't talk to us but they will talk to them and i can have i need to have concrete examples that i can present to those people that the government is forced to deal with and we have to be creative in this sense to fight against what is supposed to be impossible. I don't know if uh, someone else has a question. Well, what you have said, Larissa, I think it's very important. I think that Cuba's civil society has understood that they cannot talk with the government. The government won't listening won't listen, but they are being able to be heard by uh, international institutions. Watch out, watch out. I don't want to, I don't want to reject any possibility of dialogue. Cuban civil society, we've, we've been said that we will not repeat patterns of behavior. The government ignores us and says, I won't talk to you because you're mercenaries. And then civil society says, I'm not going to talk to dictators. Well, I think that eventually we will have to reach some kind of dialogue. Um, I will not start the conversation with the government needs to leave. That's right. Well, someone has to say that, but we need to first learn how to dialogue among ourselves. It's clear that civil society is still not able, we are not able to talk amongst ourselves. I think what they fear is articulation. That word scares them to death. I feel that there are many experts uh, in transition now. You know, we already have transitional governments in place, all set up, and they're ready to come in. But 
you know, I want one time I talked to some of them and I told them, do you know that solidarity shared was part of uh, the communist government and in Spain? Cardinal Vicente Enrique Itarancón, quien le dice en una mesa sentada. Cardinal Vicente Enrique Itanco in Spain. Busquen a Santiago Carrillo. He told Felipe González to look for Santiago Carrillo. So we need to understand transitional processes very clearly. It's like the European community, you have to yield some degree of sovereignty to enter into an exercise of diplomacy, not being dialogue. So how prepared, how smart, how prepared we are for that, I think we need to do a lot of independent study. We need to study other transitional processes. The conflict will reach a point at which there will be a dialogue. As in Nicaragua, as in Venezuela, it didn't come out of nowhere, but what happened in South Africa, the Nobel Prize, you know, it's not just Mandela, it's also Leclerc. So, I mean, I'm a historian, so I say that in history we find clear examples what happened in Russia. Change came from the top, and now you have Putin. What happened in Poland? Democracies are perfectible, states are perfectible, uh, but you have a different reality. So we have to look closely because uh, if we are able now to forge a citizenship and a social fabric, it determines what will happen tomorrow. Because tomorrow we may have just a new form of totalitarianism. Right? There are people now who are fought, but. Uh, this man has done away with treaties that cost a lot of blood. But the country is peaceful. But what about journalists, academics? What's happening, for example, with academics in Mexico? In Mexico, how many academics are leading the country? How is Morena colonizing institutions? I think that, I think that we have to go slowly, but our steps need to be crushing. Maybe we will not move so fast, but we will be walking on steady ground. When Hilda was speaking a while back, I thought about previous conversations we have had about Cuban exceptionality. I think that there is exceptionality with regard to the state, but also the opposition. When you distance yourself from all of that, you realize that there are many points of contact, and uh, we don't like to see our points of contact the region the Caribbean and Latin America, where there are now many social processes underway that we need to be aware of. And our own blindness to this is also slowing us down. This is why we cannot have a concrete achievements and articulation and the capacity 
to ah, demand no, the state mesa, no this dialogue down. because there needs to be dialogue. You need to sit someone down on the table. It cannot just be a ghost. Somebody has to be there to to respond. So I think that this idea that Cuba's process is exceptional, it's not an idea that comes from the state. The opposition also accepts, exceptionalizes this. We tend to also foster myths. Uh, sometimes they don't actually don't hurt us as much as they could. They actually lead us to go back. And after 2019, what happened on May 11th when the Congo was prevented from taking place and the LGBTIQ plus community went out on the streets to demand the right to, as they had traditionally done. Since then, there's been a kind of coordination with the civil society movements in Latin America. So we have to be understand this. Cuba is also joining into this uh, dynamic, and it was uh, harder to prove this before. But we, it, it will be also useful for us to understand that we are now part of a, a broader regional dynamic. In fact, Ulises, the cacerolazos, these small protests, it has to do with the Cuba being part of a broader wave of uh, pro protests in Latin America. In fact, we now see that Cuba is participating in a social outburst that is uh, taking, taking place throughout the region. That's right. It's hard to offer that reading because if you look at Chile and Colombia, then you would say, you would say Chile, Colombia and Cuba, they seem to be the same. Popular uprisings in response to harder life conditions as a, res as a response of uh, decisions uh, made by governments who restrict life conditions and then response violently to protests. Well, we should include Venezuela and Nicaragua. But then Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba are supposed to be on a different planet. That's Mars. And Chile and Colombia are in Neptune. And so they're saying, yeah, what's happening in Neptune is wonderful. That's cool. So uh, that's, that's the terrible thing about this construction. Some are legitimate when people in Colombia go out to the streets. That's legitimate because it's popular rage against an unjust government. When people do it in Cuba, the government is just and it's not popular rage. They are uh, imperialist mercenaries. We have to dismantle this construction and it's very difficult because uh, you can explain people, but they need to hold on to Cuba as this ideal image. It's so strong, it surpasses the existence of real Cuba. People may even visit Cuba and know what it is like now. I have a friend and I have been arguing with him for 10 years. And it's such a good example. At some point he said, we cannot discuss this anymore. You know, one day he might say, Cuba is in a horrible condition, but then the next day he will be talking about Che Guevara. And it's so strong. It's a, it's a contrast image because it's an image of the it's uh, supposed to be the world that we can hope for. It exists in Cuba, and if it doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. Uh, and then you have, for example, how the Cuban government has infiltrated academic associations in different universities. For example, the person who directs the UNAM's uh, 
human rights program. So there is an investment to place people in important institutions, and it's not so much it's an ideological image that is reinforced by a logistical operation, and it's interesting. So it's very hard because you're uh, negotiating between two very different contexts constantly. When I was expelled from the PhD program, two weeks later, there was a panel of academics and there you had Nico Lopez talking about academic freedom in Cuba. Es la institución docente, vamos a decirlo bonito, a ver, después no digan los compañeros que nos siguen, que eh, se encarga de la formación de los cuadros del Partido Comunista. De Cuba. And I'm talking about Entonces, an organization that educates the cadres of the Communist Party, and you have five academics who are part of this organization talking about academic freedom in Cuba. Well, I just received, I've just been told that five people were detained, five Cuban members of the Cuban military because they were on a, they had a WhatsApp group where apparently they were sharing out some uh, some news that uh, indicated that they supported the opposition. So, oh well, maybe we, we can conclude by saying that it seems that we may now say that there is activism in the military. Right, because as you see, uh, others in the military don't even feel that they can share. So it's a strong tradition in Cuba's military academy. We have the Udet Batista's Udetat is the result of uh, movements of opposition in the military structure. When you see what happened, what Batista did that night, you see that. A ver, no, no son episodios constantes como puede ser It's la not de ongoing, en América Latina, ¿no? Like the cuartelazos in Latin America. But there are very interesting examples if you examine them individually. Even when a la palestra política. When Batista entered politics. En una combinación de sargentos. It was a conspiracy of uh, sergeants and in the independence wars as well. So history shows that in similar political circumstances, there might be some common processes. So it's a very interesting. Because as far as I know, oil people, etc., they use Telegram. They're not allowed to use WhatsApp. Bueno, esta nota un poco interesada en otro futuro. Okay, so maybe we're talking about a different possible future here, but we wanted to end on that note. We want to thank you for meeting with us, and tomorrow we will uh, meet again. We will have a conversation about cyber activism. Thank you.